We are ready. Okay, notice of the April 11th and 12th, 2018 meeting of the Board of Architectural and Engineering Examiners was posted to the Board of Architectural and Engineering Examiners website on April 4th, 2018. This is the Engineer Committee meeting. And we will call to order. The present. Ricky Burside. Here. Kathy Ware. Present. Stephen Pleased to be here. We have four. Okay. Okay. The first and only thing on our agenda today is application review. And got on the the pages that are in front of us here it looks like five applications to look at and We'll make assignments here. Robert, uh, if you can take the first there, mm -hmm. all side. And Kathy, take Al Shibli. I will take Garamella because that sounds the most Italian of any of these names. <laughs> um, I've, I've got Jamie. You got Jamie. And if Steve, um, we'll take Thacker. If Did, all, did everybody have a chance to look at all these beforehand? So we kind of not all of them, but I did look at the one that you assigned. Okay, me. Robert, do you need some time to look at? Yeah. Okay, well we can. Okay, and I can, and I I looked at Garamella yesterday, so I can go through that. So okay, well, why don't you start, Robert? Sure. I'll say it is a. Um, it's basically an email. It's not a uh, application. It's uh, the uh, and the question is, and it's another question that we're going to have later on. Um, he's he's got a uh, transcript, but it's not an original transcript uh, because he says he can't get it from uh, the university that's in uh, Iraq, uh, University of Tikrit, Tikrit um, that is in Iraq. So we've got in our um, policy that we developed, we did have something that where a applicant did not have to have an original transcript from the university if that university was in an area that was uh, subject to a war or had been destroyed or damaged because of a war and 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 I you know just from the news I would guess uh, this this area I've heard this word several times that this may qualify for that I, I don't know how we verify that I don't know how we verify that that university has been destroyed in his records because in his email he doesn't say that it's destroyed he says he's got difficulties having them mailed directly uh to the to ncws so it seems like they're available to have it's just they're difficult to get to I'm not trying to be heartless but we could have that same sentiment stated by almost everybody that applies for the pe I mean, it may be harder to get your transcripts from one university versus the other, or you have to go through some process to make sure they get uh, mailed in the right way. I mean, it's more than just, and, and I'm not doubting his difficulties here, I, but we do have a line that I think that we have to draw somehow. And um, I. I I did not see that. I, I apologize. I was just looking at the front here. And I think sometimes the issue if it may not just be limited to war, but sometimes the security issue with documents and originals being, you know, put in the mail or, or caught attention to the fact that the family's left, that kind of thing. So sometimes it's a security Yeah, and, and, and I may be more sympathetic to that for the Iran situation, but, I mean, Iraq, from what I understand, um, has got a fairly free flow of people from the United States to Iraq because of, you know, obviously we uh, spilled a lot of American blood over there trying to get that in that situation. So, um, the University of Tennessee, where he got his master's degree, wouldn't right. they have the transcript that he submitted like for right. to get into their program? So, that was a kind of an offline discussion we were having on one of the others is, is we would think that there would be some documentation from 
their university that they got into for a master's program. Uh, and if the university has accepted it, it seems to me that it's probably okay for us to accept it for them to be able to get into a master's program. So that's where I would start and see if they've got something that they can verify or something that they can um, um, stand behind because he doesn't say the university has been destroyed, which I think is what our policy says, is that it has to have been destroyed during a war or something. And I think we should, um, oh, sorry. I Go think ahead. we should ask um, him to submit uh, proof of the difficulty, maybe some email correspondence with the university if he some attempt to try to get it the way that wise. we require. Yeah. yeah, I think that's why. I just don't want to set up a situation where I would just cause it, and, and I think, Kathy, you made this point last time about the, the references. You know, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's, there are a lot of things that we all do in our jobs that are hard, and if we just said, oh, well, it's hard, we're not going to do it, then it would be called play, it wouldn't be called work. And um, so I, I think we do need to make sure that they go through some process to do that. I will, I'll say that we have an <clears throat> engineer in our, at my company who, from Ukraine, who he couldn't get his transcript either it wasn't it wasn't because of war or the building was but there they just didn't have the staff they weren't going to do it so he traveled to ukraine and they let him just told him to go in the basement and find it <laughs> whatever and so he got it he got the by going to ukraine so there are degrees of not being able to get it and not being able to get it so right. so i agree with what you're saying okay. I think that's probably a, a good thing is just to ask from the university what he got from them. Well, some other correspondence, excuse me, that would indicate uh, tr between what he and the, the university in Iraq have been going back and forth and why it is a security issue. I just don't understand that part of it as much. I think Let I'm me say that some of it is probably a language barrier too because I have someone who works for me who is a, who's Kurdish. And he fell into exactly, uh, truly, he couldn't get his transcripts. But he's been with me for almost 12 years now. And when he first came, we went through this whole discussion, and he never was able to get his. So he has an engineering degree from one of the institutions over there, could never get it. He is a very good technician, but their, their language barrier also presents, because I read this email and I think to myself, I'm trying really hard to understand his word choice. So I don't think he really means it. Like when we think of security, that's not really what he means. But in his mind, he's trying to pick the American word that conveys the level of difficulty. But I agree. It's hard. He's going to have to make more effort than just saying, hey, it's hard. Can you give me a pass? Would you um, be comfortable with the board office then generally from the consensus we're coming up with saying that, uh, you know, they was every effort that's been made and if they've done any schooling in, in the United States, obviously that schooling wouldn't have accepted them without documentation. So we expect all those efforts to be made before they can ask for any type of exception because we're just not going to that way. We don't need to present these requests consistently. I'm good with that. Also, Mr. King said he's going to be here about 2.15. Well, actually, he didn't. He said two sixteen, and he didn't put any of the little dot dots in there. So he may be he may be in room two sixteen. <laughs> may be something. Okay. Are we ready to move on, Kathy? To okay. Uh, so uh, kind of the same situation where we've got a foreign degree undergraduate. He had it evaluated by an acronym that I don't even know what it stands for, to be honest with you. I just know that it's not acceptable to NCWS. And according to our staff, they checked with NCWS, and they've already told this gentleman that it is not equivalent, and he's asking for a waiver. And, you know, my response would be, I don't think we grant a waiver just because somebody asked for it. So he needs to go through proper channels. And if he's already been told by NCWS that he hasn't yet gone through proper channels, I don't think we even need to take action other than just to uh, send him a note saying, keep trying. Yeah. Okay. He also has the other option of getting Dr. Smith to evaluate it, right? 
He'd have to at least submit an application. Yeah, but I mean, the Dr. Smith could evaluate his transcript as easily as if the transcript's complete. Yes. Okay, so the um, Kathy, can you just restate recommendation on? We, I would went. recommend that we instruct staff to just tell her that, or tell him that he needs to submit, submit to either NCWS or to submit to us. No decision to be made at this time. Somebody tell me what AACRAO is. Not, not common, though. Not your common. You all don't know it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> okay, why don't we move on to Gary Mella? That was one that I reviewed. And the question I have on that is whether the the bachelor's degree meets our requirements and because I'm seeing a couple of different things but what if if you would look on uh, your iPads at page 29 that's uh, NCEES evaluation Google the acronym if you're interested in it's um, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers and just from Wikipedia it says it's a nonprofit voluntary professional association of more than 11,000 higher education professionals who represent approximately 2,600 institutions in more than 40 countries with the mission of providing professional development guidelines and voluntary standards, um, et cetera, used in the college admissions process. So, not NCES equivalent. Okay, is there everybody on 29? Have we got that? Okay, that, that shows, hey Steve, that shows that According to NCES, the math science has no deficiencies. And um, that I have is if you go to, then go to page 56. It looks like this was maybe 2010, <clears throat> 2010 when this was evaluated. This is in CES, and it shows that the deficiencies are 14 hours in math and basic science. Is down when you go down the page there, and there, I didn't, I didn't see any education that happened since 2010 so I've got to think they're looking at the same education track record as they did before and then if you back up one page on page 55 there's a letter from Dr. Smith who evaluated it and said that the applicant is 10.5 hours deficient in math and science three in math and seven in science and his recommendation is to take an advanced level math course and two courses in science. So I'm confused about how NCES could have two different, maybe they just, maybe it was a different person did it two different times and came up with two different things, but that's a pretty different answer. To go from 14 hours to it's not deficient. They do that quite often now. They'll go back and reevaluate and change 
the deficiencies. So That's why I don't know. Well, so remember, uh, ABET changed their evaluation criteria too. So uh, it used to be that you had to have um, so many classes equated to hours, and, I, and I'm at a loss, but. Uh, Doctor, that was something that Dr. Smith had to change some of his evaluating criteria too, because it's not strictly uh, crap. What is that? So, and I'm going to use a bad example, I think. But let's say you had a sociology class that you had to present an engineering topic on. You would get some credit for that and I may be messing that up but it's the difference in the way the ABET criteria is maybe from 2010 because they've just changed that within the last three to four years Chris we've got an expert in there does that sound right there's something they changed and I can't remember the two words they use but they changed because Dr. Smith came and talked to us and it may have been four or five years ago that said ABET had changed their criteria from a something to a something and qualitative to a something. I, I may be totally wrong, but making this up. <laughs> no, I know he said that because it's the way that, yeah, I got to think about that because he did say something that they had changed their evaluation criteria to cover the range of stuff rather than you had to have you have to cover topics not specific classes maybe that's what it amounted to go ahead go ahead yeah because I'm I'm messing up here I think I'm, I'm Chris Gwaltney from Lipscomb University and um, I think what they changed is they quit they, they used to be bean counters basically and they'd say so many engineering science courses so many science courses so many engineering design courses hours uh, basically and they counted all those in the curriculum um i don't when you talk about sociology i'm not sure how that, that fell that in to the picture thing. but um yeah so uh, you yeah, know so many basic science courses uh, i think that's probably what you're talking about it uh, did change slightly the way that they looked at the number of hours versus did you get that topic covered yes. within the breadth of your education now they're not really counting hours now like they used to. Yes, it's correct. more of the subject matter. Is that subject matter here? I think I'm talking into. Is the subject matter? Are you covering 30 hours of science within your curriculum rather than having uh, chemistry, biology, physics, boom, 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 or something? They, they give us a little more flexibility now to. I think that changed four or five do. years ago. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, maybe even to, longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Dr. Smith said something. So that may be the difference is they've looked and said within the breadth of what he's doing, he's got enough science, but it may not be A, B, C, and D. So that's, thank you very much. That, that, that's what I was trying to struggle with. One other thing I'll point out is the, the NCES on page 29, the review that says there's no deficiency it said there's a date at the bottom of the sheet march 16 2018 so i guess that's the latest review and when you go to the next page and you look at the math and science that's listed there that they add up to be 35 and generally i'm used to seeing differential equations as a fourth math class and two chemistries and two physics or something like that and I don't see that in that list and it would be good for me to know as a reviewer has that changed is that we no longer looking for differential equations uh, I thought that was a kind of a criteria and it my what I'm thinking there kind of matches up with what Dr. Smith said in his review I know that was a 10, 2010 letter but <clears throat> I guess my point here is it would be good to know if we're going to be reviewing these applications maybe a little more about the criteria for an acceptable bachelor's degree like well let me make this suggestion um, maybe for a future meeting and I don't know if it's a uh, 
retreat topic or something because I think we need to all kind of get reminded of the ABET, kind of what they look for and, and what those hours look like because there has been enough of a change. And then we've also just recently looked at another change that they're they're making. It's not as – it's got some things in it, but maybe try to talk about that a little bit because I get – I get well, kind of whipsawed on that myself. I agree. Let me just throw out, too, that because of the changes that ABET has allowed certain curriculums over the years, I don't know if y'all remember this or were aware of it, but about 10 years ago, they allowed statics and dynamics to become one class for a while. And then after that was a huge failure, back to it being separate classes. And I believe, but I couldn't swear to it, but I believe that they allowed differential equations to be folded into Calculus 3. It also became one class. So it's possible that when, depending on when they went to school, that what you and I think of as standard curriculum, could, could, they could have just fallen into a window of time in which that wasn't exactly the same thing, which may then lend itself to this thing where one time they were looked at and found to be very deficient and then a few years later they were looked at and found to be well we'll come to think of it that actually is pretty close so i for one would love to have dr smith come in maybe we should think about that for october isn't that our retreat month uh, to come in and give us an update on what constitutes a legitimate curriculum uh, because i think there's probably a curriculum from the 80s and a curriculum from the 90s and a curriculum from the early 2000s that all would be considered quote unquote equivalent. But I know that I kind of look at them as my own framework, my own perspective. And, and I would just love to know what really constitutes a bit accredited equivalent degree. And I think, and I would just throw out that I think that this we probably need to have Dr. Smith do another, <laughs> if we've got three, it looks like we've got three evaluations, if I read correctly. There was an NCWS, and there was a Dr. Smith, and there, there's another NCWS. So maybe we need one more Dr. Smith clarification. Yeah. Uh, I th I'm coming to uh, maybe a recommendation that we've got two differing evaluations from NCEES, and I just have a hard time just approving the latest one just because um, I don't understand. And so I wonder if both of the NCES, if this were sent to somebody at NCES and flagged to, for them to look at those two pages and say, was is this, re is this real, is this, can you explain this or was it a mistake? one way or another and I think that would maybe shed some light on it where I've where I feel like I could do something with it Kathy I'd be happy to reach out to NCWS um, regarding the ABET um, standards um, I remember at the annual meeting last year ABET gave a presentation so I think maybe we could get a copy that um, prior to the October meeting um, for the board members to review, and then we could still reach out to Dr. Smith and have him come in October. Where, where is the I think by June we'll have an answer if we will be somewhere here. In, I, I have a feeling in Middle Tennessee, so we'll definitely know the number of days and so forth. But I agree, I think having Dr. Smith as the expert would be great, and probably if he came before, he'd be willing. It would just be easier for him since he's in West Tennessee, right, to have something here or out closer. To that. I mean, just. Okay. Alton, you ready to? I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. I'm fired up. Um, I apologize for the mispronunciation. It's my middle Tennessee. Tommy. Uh, is, is an applicant who is educated in Iran. Uh, she initiated her education at a campus away from the main campus and studied civil and surveying engineering. Later, that independent campus became completely independent from the main university. 
it's, it's a little ambiguous as to whether she completed her degree at the independent separate campus or she had to go back to the main campus to complete that, I'm not sure. But she's indicating uh, in her comments back to Wanda that she's made an attempt to acquire the information related to her transcript. NCWS has already told her we can't process this without the transcript. And she's made some attempt to get that, but she's now saying that because she was at the independent campus for the first two years, the main campus could not provide her transcript, and the independent campus is now separate and uh, also, for whatever reason, can't give her a course by course syllabus either. Um, We've got a really good response from NCWS, I, I think, that encapsulates what our position probably should be. One of the one of the comments back from the manager of credentials and records at NCWS is that they actually receive transcripts from this university for students all the time. So it's not it's it, it's not beyond concept that this individual should also have a transcript um, say that there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get a transcript from this university this uh, miss Jami is a licensed professional she got her FE in California I, I'm not exactly sure how uh, she got a master's degree from Memphis University in transportation uh, focus on transportation and I'll go back to what you were talking about before. If they got a master's degree, how did they get entrance into the university if they didn't provide a transcript? So there, there may be some opportunity for her to capture the transcript from the University of Memphis. Uh, she got her PE in Virginia. And again, I'm uncertain how that occurred either without having a transcript. I'm not sure how Virginia goes about if, if they have to have NCWS acknowledgement, review, and approval before they'll allow them uh, a PE. So, and I think my recommendation would be almost exactly what we discussed uh, for Mr. Al Saeed is that we defer back to the applicant and, and advise them, pursue this more diligently, either through the university in Iran or through the University of Memphis, or through whatever process she used to submit her transcript for licensure in Virginia. I'll mention that I, I believe from my notes that Ms. Jami came here la at our last board meeting and spoke to us about this issue, and um, we didn't promise anything. We uh. just listened. And, and again, we didn't have the information from NCWS, their response at that time. That only came March 18th, I believe, something like that. After Ms. Jami submitted her information in February and her request in February. So we've got a response from NCWS, and I think it's, uh, I think it's a very competent response. One of the issues with NCES is they need a course by course assessment. Mm -hmm. And just a transcript wouldn't do. They've got to have. Good, good point, and thank you, uh, Wanda. But she ought to be able to, if, if, she was, if she gained entrance into the University of Memphis and she was able to sit for, pass the test, and, and receive her PE in Virginia. I would think that somewhere that exists and it was provided. I can't believe she cleared those two hurdles without, without having access to that in some way. And, and the fact that Mr. Ms. Nebeski from NCWS says that they receive that information, that specific information that they ordinarily require as part of the review process on a regular basis from that university indicates to me that it's available. And, and I'll kind of, the website's a website, right? But I've Googled this website whenever. Um, and it looks to be like a real 
college website. I mean, you know, it's hey, if you're from wherever, come and apply. Of, you know, I mean, it's not like it's some sort of cut off from the rest of the world thing. I mean, it was they were welcoming students from all over Europe and different places to come and study at like the mother of all engineering schools or something like that. I don't know exactly what it was called, but something. So um, anyway, I mean, it wasn't like it was just. Amir Kabir University of Technology. Yeah, I've looked at. I mean, that's it. wasn't like your guys' example. We had to go down the basement. It looked like everything was pretty well. It didn't strike you as a school that couldn't provide a transcript. No, no. I mean, they had a very sophisticated-looking website. Yeah. So, well, and the NCAAS has received. Again, we received them all the time from this university. Okay. I think my recommendation is the same recommendation we entered. Or maybe Liz entered for uh, Mr. Al Said. The only thing I'd like to point out is that she does have a bunch of references from a bunch of PEs, and she's been working here under in Tennessee. here, right here in Middle Tennessee, and she gets really high marks. So I just want to make sure we take, and because she came last month or when we had our meeting two months ago. I mean, I, I just don't want it to come across as the board thinks that she's trying to get over on us. I, I think that she may or may not be willing to put forth the effort, which is going to be above and beyond normal effort. But I don't get the impression that she's trying to get over on the board or, or quote, it's been, it's been phrased as bypass the system. And I hate to think that we, we would label her with that. So I, I, just I like specifically left that off of yeah. the comments I, I did not want to introduce that and to introduce any bias and and I, I agree with you I know most of the people that gave her references and and uh, I, I, she uh, although one of them used contentious misused that I think that she, they were trying to give her a positive I think they were trying to say conscientious I think they were too <laughs> And I think the board can, you know, request her to show more proof of um, trying to seek the transcript without adopting the statement from NCWES that she was trying or not trying to bypass the system. So I think the board can safely say, you know, we were alerted by them of this. We don't necessarily adopt this statement, but hey, can you show us more information of trying to get the transcript? There's one other, uh, just to add on to that recommendation. I would ask Ms. Jami to uh, also probably contact Ms. Nebeski with NCWS, who obviously has some sort of contact with this university who should be able to help her through the process and find her records. Um, That's a great idea. Okay, Steve, I had, uh, I think I'd given you Thacker. Did you get, okay. Yes, the, the, we have a, a common theme today, and that's foreign degrees. Um, Mr. Thacker's degree is, is if from another country, and he has a master's from a United States school, George Mason. His, his experience and his references all look very good, but his degree hadn't been evaluated by anyone. I, I didn't see a Dr. Smith email or a, a evaluation from NCWS. Seem we're lacking that. I don't think we can just approve a, a foreign degree without some evaluation to the ABET standards. He is one of one of these um, that has trouble getting a transcript sent from the school, and he is he has asked that that we send his copy of the transcript to NCWS for review. But there again, I, I don't know if there's course descriptions. Summarize that correctly, Wanda. I'm just curious. What what do we have a policy relative to people asking us 
to send transcripts and information to NCWS? I, I think we've done that before. But Do you only, recall? Only in cases like Mr. Campbell said, where it's a war-torn country and they can't get them, then we have to authorize NCES to accept what they have. I see. Okay, thank you. They have to be destroyed, correct? Mm -hmm. And they're unretrievable? Or the university's no longer in business. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think there was a provision for that as well. I would think if... <laughs> Even if they no longer exist, those transcripts, those documents re probably reside somewhere. I can imagine if they were blown up. That, that, that would I be notice different. that this one is a Virginia registrant also. Uh, yes. Is it possible for us to contact the Virginia board and just ask them, do they have a method by which they can verify and that's what allows them to let registrants sit? Um, that maybe we're just, you know, Maybe they can just share a little wealth of knowledge there. But this is two of the six we're talking about today. You know what? You can ask them that question. I can ask them next week, can't week, can I? I'll do that. <laughs> That's a great discussion topic. It is a good thing you're week. here today, Robert. So is that staying on your to-do list? If I remember. <laughs> but no, we can, but we a weekend can and out. a couple of hockey games are going to come between now and then. There so, you, go. you know. No, we, can, we can definitely ask and see if they've got some some method or maybe not you know, looking at everything in the same way we are. Uh, if they've attended school in the oh, I will mention, just looking at the, the records for the undergraduate degree, did you see that, Steve, from? Transcript? Yes. Yeah, it looked. It looks a little weak. I mean, there's, my, I, I think there's, uh, a, as an unless I'm evaluator. There's only, I know, it's like, kind of like working on a jet engine or something when you don't really know about them. But yeah. <clears throat> I only see one math class, yeah, I one three-hour math class. I don't see any chemistry or physics. Um, and I just wonder if this is more of a technology degree. I know sometimes a lot of times that the foreign, you, they'll use technology they, in the name of the school or the degree in but, foreign countries. But if it's equivalent to our BS, you see the math and science in there. Right. Yeah. Just a slight uh, change of information. It looks. I, I'm not sure about this. I, I, I do see that he's practicing in Virginia, but it looks like his licensure was in Maryland. So he must have set for the exam in Maryland. We're, we're going to ask for an evaluation. Yes. Okay. I think that's all the applications, one, unless we're missing any. I get it. Um, and there's nothing else on our agenda. I mean, there was just the one thing about the, the associate member, right? That was the second thing, wasn't it? Did I miss that? Last page is um, NCWS Notice of Software Engineering. And that is something that you may have all already received. I added um, what they sent out in March. This is regarding the dis discontinuation of the software engineering PE exam. I just figured if you've got individuals in your firms that we want to share this with. I know it's already been discontinued, so. Did I, did I, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I must have spoke something. One other thing, uh, and I talked to Roxana about this. I, I received a request for clarification uh, from Lipscomb University about a student who had applied for their, I think, FE certificate, Chris, if I'm not mistaken. and. Uh, Chris is here today. Roxanne, if it's not out of protocol, could I ask Chris to step forward and sort of explain the situation? There you go. You go. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Alton, for letting me ask the question. So, um, 
We had a student that has taken the FE exam and passed it, um, and then she applied for the the certificate from the board, um, and she had a form that she asked me to sign to say that she was in good standing as a as an engineering student at Lipscomb, uh, which I did, and found out that I wasn't authorized to sign it, which was fine. We cleared that up, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and that's all been taken care of. Uh, but my real question was that we, we at Lipscomb at least, were under the assumption that um, before a, before a um, potential uh, graduate could get their certificate for to be an FE, that they had to graduate. Now, Roxanne has sent me the code, the uh, Tennessee code that says that the student has to... I, I, one or. It, one, yeah. One or. Oh, one or the other, which um, seems a bit odd to me that um, that a student... Just explain one or the other. Okay, please. so either you graduate and pass the exam or you pass the exam and you're in good standing. Okay, so it was... Ours, good it standing. Was, so, so in other words, uh, 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 we, you can, this person, this student, any, any student in the state of Tennessee, I suppose, could be in good standing at the university take the uh, FE exam, pass the FE exam, and get a certificate that they're an FE without graduating. Okay, so that seems odd to me. <laughs> it is odd, but it's odd because of the way the process worked itself out is that we, we basically ceded control of the FE process to NCWS when they went electronic because now applicants have to send everything straight to them and it doesn't come to us and they could probably take the fe as a freshman i mean i, I mean you couldn't but in, conceivably you could do that uh i think you're you're supposed to sign off before they take it though as the, somebody in the university is no supposed we to do sign not anymore. okay so we, we used to but we don't need yeah anymore. and so i think that they they literally can go sign up take the fe pass the fe and then there's no other control on the back end to keep them from applying for their stiff because I think that's how we wrote the rule law, whatever change that we made, in order to let them apply straight to NCWS instead of having to come through us and then do what you're talking about, get the professor or the dean to say they're a senior in good standing or whatever. Do we do we want and I'm saying do do the uh, does the state and the engineering, um, you know, so society of the state want people that are signing as FEs? And I know that doesn't really mean anything legally as far as what they can do. Do we want them signing as a FE and not have a degree? Yeah, but, but see, I could, I think in the old system, though, I could, uh, I mean, I passed mine in um, April, whenever it was. But I didn't graduate till August or whenever summer. I had a couple classes I had to finish up in the summer. We're still in practice in engineering. The way I'm seeing it, I'm not sure that it kills me, but because I don't know that that does. I mean, the FE really is just a check mark. It's not anything that's legally. It's a step in the process towards life. I mean, I, that's just the way I'm seeing it right now, I, and I may be wrong, but it's just a check mark going to the ultimate goal. So I may be wrong on that. I, w I went back and looked at, because I'm more familiar with Indiana law than I am Tennessee or anywhere else, and I went back to, and looked at theirs, and they specifically say that it, you must be a graduate, you must pass the FE exam before you can obtain an FE certificate. And that was the, that was what I guess I've been going on. Uh, we have been, at, at Lipscomb, at the end of the school year, we, the dean provides a letter and identifies all of the engineering students that graduated. Uh, and that was really in lieu of this form that we just got. And, and I've seen it the last couple of years, so I'm assuming it's a new, a new form. But, uh, so that was our, like, here, here you go, state. Here's the people that graduated. And now you cross-check those with the people that have passed the FE exam, give them a certificate. That was the assumption we were going under. Um, and I was curious. I didn't look to see when that law was. When, what's the this, date on I mean, that law? This is statute it? was last changed in 2013. So if the question is what was Tennessee legislature's intent in changing the statute, we would have to look.
back at the history. Um, unfortunately, this topic was not presented to me prior to this meeting for me to have an answer for you prepared today. Um, but I, I will read the statute to the statute in question that we're talking about just so everybody's on the same page. It's um, 622402 engineer intern. The following shall be considered as minimum evidence satisfactory to the board that the applicant is qualified for registration as an engineer intern. A graduate in a curriculum of four years or more leading to a baccalaureate degree in engineering by the board as of satisfactory standing or who is a prospective graduate in good standing in the senior year in such a curriculum passes an examination prepared by the National Council of Examiners surveying involving the fundamentals of engineering provided that the applicant is of good character and repute um, so in doing legal research after this meeting I can find information from the legislature we can look at the original bill watch videos of them discussing it on the floor um, but this topic wasn't on the agenda so I don't have that information for you right now when was 2013 that was actually before they went to computer before you changed that, the, that, that was the year that it was actually oh, fully implemented okay it was yeah okay we're going to it in the next year and we had to get because really they you had could hired have, Pearson view though they already had it laid out yeah. you could have a student then with a that was a senior standing and still act another year and a half before they actually graduated but they could still take the FE in September you know and that's it. It, I, yeah. so that's I think that was our thought process was we didn't want to hold those students back that could go ahead and take it and so, so to, I mean and again I may be looking at this wrong the FE to me is just a check mark. It's not, I mean, I don't hate to say it that glibly because I sweated it like everybody else did, but uh, it gives you no legal standing to do anything in the state of Tennessee. It's just a step you have to go through, like graduating. You can't even hold school. yourself out as an engineer. No. So. Well, I, I do find it odd, though, that, that a, a graduate that doesn't take or doesn't pass the FE cannot put FE behind their name and a person that does not graduate from an engineering program can that that's that just doesn't set well with me and that's okay there's a lot of things that don't set well with me in life <laughs> <We all laughs> and remember. I just accept them and get on with it but, <laughs> <laughs> but it just I, I don't think that that's the way everybody understands it um, I mean I mentioned it to, at the ASCE meeting the other day and everybody was what you know as really and then one guy out of the group said yeah I got my certificate before I graduated and, oh okay where'd you graduate Tennessee Tech and he you know he was a Tennessee guy so uh, let's look into I mean I think it's something to look into but I think it what the intent was to not limit those students that could possibly take the test based on having you know the graduation criteria and we that may have been an oversight and it may have been something that we again looked at and said that's strictly a check mark. Uh, it's not going to, you know, most people that pass the FE are going to go graduate it pretty quickly, I would think. You think so. <laughs> I, I think that it's, it's kind of clumsy either way you do it. If, you, if somebody's in their senior year and they take it in the fall and then they wait for graduation, say, the next August or whatever, or May, would – how does all that get done the, to get the certificate done? Do they have to remember? Does the does NCES do it? Does the school do it? Whereas if they if they get it right when they take the test, you know, if it's really part of passing the test and it's kind of NCES based, then that's it's kind of cleaner. But then you have the clumsy side of it, like you're talking about, that you've got somebody who's not actually a graduate who a graduate who maybe they don't graduate and but yet they're an FE. So I, I think it's clumsy both ways and maybe it's just has has come to this because it's a it, it gets it done more efficiently as far as the the FE part of the the in the certificate part of it. And I I'm kinda like Robert, I don't even though it's clumsy, I don't I don't feel like it's um a compromise to the public or anything to to call a senior who's passed the FE test 
they can call themselves an engineering intern. And I don't think that's a compromise in any way because they're not going to go anywhere beyond that without being a graduate. I, I think there's a pretty expressed intent <laughs> If they've gone that far and they've set for that hateful exam they're going to get that they're going to get that degree they're going to finish that degree i understand from a from a university's perspective how you wouldn't want to create a an open door to them getting an fe but not finishing their education but i i really i, I think the opportunity for that 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 would occur is extremely remote i can actually see where it would be beneficial to the student so I would suggest to you that there's a possibility that, say, they take it in the fall as soon as they feel like they're rel they're ready, and then they're a co-op student. Well, if they're a co-op student, it may be another year. But when they're in that co-op position, it might be really beneficial to the people that are their supervisor to know that they've already sat for the exam and passed it. And it may actually help them in their career. It may also help them in their job search. So I can see where it would be beneficial to be able to have those two little letters after your name. As a student. But as a student before you graduate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just, I know we haven't really put it out there as a decision we need to make, but just thinking about it, I, I, I see, they has no authority. They get no authority by being able to put EI after their well, name. So it would serve the same purpose if they just wrote on their resume, have, I have passed the FE exam. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? I look at a lot of resumes, and when I see, when I go, I go, T -t 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 EI, oh, good. I don't have to read a full sentence. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> could be hiring uh, engineers that don't have a degree. Not engineers. Mm -hmm. You could be hiring somebody with an FE that doesn't hasn't finished their degree. You could be hiring someone you think has an engineering degree. No. I mean, I'm talking about for, for summer work. So you look for that as well on a oh, summer. Oh, absolutely. Just for summer work. You yeah. look for IE on the summer work. Oh, sure. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, I think it could be beneficial to the student to do it that way. And now with the ease of access to, to sit for the FE, I mean, you exactly. can sit multiple times yeah. a year, not just October and April anymore. You know, it, many of them, some of them want to take it almost just for a practice. Uh, and they can take it multiple times, and they know that, and so it, 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 they use it as almost a prep course. I can I can see that too. So, so just, I didn't look at this, but what's the what's NCES's model law say with regards to the the sort of certificate? Yeah, I didn't, but that's probably close to what it says. I'm just guessing. Yeah, Particularly I'm, I'm, now, I'll, since I'll they're look, the one that really heavily promoted this conversion to computer-based testing. Yeah, and and before this, they wouldn't allow you to set for it until six months before you graduated. So I'm I'm fine with the early Which I earlier said. setting, but I'm just not so I'm, good I'm, with the. Go I'm going to interrupt just for a minute because we're going to move on and bring the architects on board that are here, and we have a full session with them. But I do want to. What I'm picking up from this is that this was decided on and actually passed for for various reasons in 2013. I don't know that Liz needs to do any research if, in fact, there's no reason and no harm to the public by it being an and or both paths. Is that accurate? Because anytime, okay, so she does research, it's just pulling her from something else. And so if it passed, everybody voted, had time to opine on it, I think um, we're definitely following both paths. So I think we're okay. And I do think, just going back to Chris's thing, I do think that NCAAS modified their model law when they went to qualification. I'm sorry computer-based testing, but I, I, I did not look at that. I haven't looked at that, but I think that's a good idea for us to look at that, too. Well, I'm, I'm fine with the way you're doing it. I am just wanted some clarification that we're, that we're doing the thing we need to be doing and that this didn't sneak in the back door and nobody knew that it happened. Thank, so. thank you for yeah, being sure. here to present that. Okay. Ready to bring so we can con yeah, we can con conclude the engineer conclude. committee meeting. We'll bring on board, if that's okay, our, our architect committee. And um, I still want to ask one thing before we yes. do. Yes. Oh, did we did we decide on associates review and applications? Oh. Oh, they didn't. Right. I thought we. You all. We talked about it, but there was no official decision on the record. If we are okay with with uh, the review of the transactions being done by the associates as well, and moving on with those. I'm going to review them anyway. So I mean, it doesn't matter to me whatever everybody wants to do. I'm going to still look at them. If 
I can put my signature on it, I'm gonna still look at it. I mean, I'm for letting Robert do all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could we could definitely bring on the architects and start the um, the applica the definitions and move on, and hopefully at the end, then if we've got a minute, make sure that we're all on the same page before we start distributing them differently. Okay. Are there any items on, at the on the NCWS agenda that we need to talk about before the the meeting? Usually we do that. I don't know if there are or not. Good question. We are back on the record. Good afternoon. As a reminder for the start of the meeting, this was um, a joint committee meeting requested by both the engineer committee and the architect committee to have a discussion um, amongst yourselves as to whether or not you wanted to have a definition of your practice and also what that would look like if you do decide that that's the route you would like to take. Um, I passed out documents. The first one, the larger packet, has model law from NCARB and NCWS, and then it also has other states' um, statutes, statutes and rules that do have a definition of practice. And then I also pass out a document that you've seen uh, previously. Uh, it was Legal's first draft of crafting a definition for us here in Tennessee. Um, it was not well liked amongst either committee, but just for your reference of what you didn't like, I did pass that out to you as well, and that's the single sheet document. <laughs> Who's your architect, Chairman? Who's um, chairman of the architect committee? Rick is. Uh, wait a minute, Mr. Wait a minute. <laughs> you arm wrestle, you flip coins, you do that stupid game where you take a bottle and try to throw it up and then let it stick in the ground. Well, if you want me to be, since you have to yeah. be the chair of the real one, I guess I can certainly care. <laughs> Welcome to. Okay, this is a joint meeting of the Architects and Engineers Committees. Um, the topic is definition of um, defining architecture and engineering, which we don't have currently definitions of the practice. And correct me if I'm wrong, Brian and Frank, the Architects Committee has, has voted to adopt a definition is that correct or what what is the status that may be the case that I'm not sure we have the definition we're wanting to adopt yet. right right but I mean it was there a decision made that I think it, the decision was that we felt it was better to have a definition than to not okay. yeah. I think that was it. I don't think we actually, we actually agreed on any um, language yet okay okay and, that, and I think the engineering committee has not, we have not reached that point. In fact, I don't feel like we have really debated it, it to any kind of 
conclusion whether we want a definition or not. Alton? Can I ask the Architecture Committee why you felt like it was important to have a definition? It, it mainly comes to, to head when we have some kind of legal a formal hearing where somebody says I don't have this or that or other but qualified I'm an, I can to do architectural work and so if there's a and there's not a definition to to come to look at to and Liz you might speak to that a little bit I think that's the main reason is is to have a definitive answer when somebody says you know what does it mean to be a registered architect in Tennessee? See, I mean, one of the, uh, and I understand what, that. What's the definition? What is an architect? And here's, here's the figure, because a lot of the complaints that we get in review have to do with the fire marshal's office submitting something to us where somebody's signed a structural, electrical, mechanical, civil, <coughs> and, and sometimes architectural drawing. Um, and if if you look at some of the model law definitions, I'm a, I'm afraid by entering those that you pretty much open the door for someone to do that, and you remove any reasonable I see the, judgment. I see, the, I see the dilemma in defining an engineer. Where does that mean you're mechanical or electrical or you know? By, by test, some of that is separated out, and you could possibly separate that out by definition. But it's like if you've got a, and I used to call them civil, sanitary, sanitary, structural, if you've passed that test, you know, there's a whole lot of plumbing design engineers that don't know a lot about civil, and I'm sure they all do, but I, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, having that particular... Uh, uh, license um, is kind of sketchy sometimes as to what is stamped even though you have to accept it I'm assuming I mean I, I don't review you know y'all's problems but um, in architecture it's a little more it's less separated out than it is in the engineering definition and I, I could see I understand the problem um, there are obviously NCWS apparently has a, a version of what they recommend, um, and there are other states that have defined what engineering means. Um, and the architectural, you know, I've tried to ask at meetings and so forth uh, if if particular states have a definition of architecture. Uh, most of them that the board is a board of architects have a definition the ones that are mixed it's it's hit or miss and and I'm not sure there's even any I mean we've one discussion I think that that's been had is uh, if we define architects do we need to define everybody or could we just define here's what an architect is and engineers can figure it out for themselves <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can or maybe we can't <laughs> yeah but I think that's where where we stand. I think ours is a little more. Yeah. Our, I, I, another concern is if you try to enter a definition, there's always going to be, but because you've defined it, there can always be exceptions. Uh, there, there can always be alternate translations. Uh, and I, I worry that that could become a slippery slope, at least for the engineering profession also. Some of these are very, uh, probably intentionally so, ambiguous. I mean, you don't really define specifically what you do. You sort of define how you're educated, maybe, and what you're what you're trying to practice. And one of the things you said earlier about how um, engineers are able to stamp architecture drawings, I've even noticed that, like in something I recently looked at, where perhaps if there was a real definition of what an architect does, it would even help with some of when people are, maybe that's a little different because it's an engineer stamping architect, stamping architect drawings, but um, I almost felt like because there was 
I don't know if that was the right example, but it could be where because it was so ambiguous, there was it could be anything. You know, there is no definition that we didn't really have anything to kind of go back to. That's a you know there there are some other you know um, health safety welfare things, but so I don't know. It, I, for me, I. I I kind of would frank on it if you had this, you know, because engineering is so so much broader, you know, I could kind of see where you don't want to get into all of it, but I almost feel like with us we could use something that kind of outlines. We have so many people who want to do architect, so many people want to do architect, not so that that's why I felt I was more in favor of it anyway. Sure, okay, I understand that. I I, I do. I just I, engineer okay. might mean you drive a train. <laughs> <laughs> Not a PE it's, though. It's it's been a <laughs> make more the term money has been a, that way. <laughs> I mean, I can go through a lot of factories, and half the people there are engineer this and engineer that. And none of them are, you know. So we could go through a software firm though, and see a lot of architect stuff. But <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I have kind of done a big circle on this whole issue because I'm I'm kind of like you, Frank. When it interest interested me. To have things to find when I had to do two or three complaint cases, all of them were churches, and um, and one of them the engineer stamped every sheet, including the architecture, and it was obvious that the engineer didn't know architecture code. I mean, you know, building code issues. There were there was just a lot of a lot of things that weren't addressed. And so when I was reviewing that, I was thinking, sure it would be nice to say if you're going to do architecture, you ought to have an architecture degree and have passed that test. <laughs> you know, even if that was it, then we wouldn't have to be looking at plans like this. Um, and then, and then, same with engineering. You know, it 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 worked, worked the other way too, where the architect stamped every sheet. And I was looking at those, thinking it'd be nice if you had to have an engineering degree and have passed. The PE test to have your stamp on an engineering sheet, and I thought it was pretty clear cut, straightforward. But I guess there's um, there's a I guess you can't get rid of gray areas. There's the incidental practice thing that I I have I mean I've my whole career have worked with structural engineers that you know they they can do architecture industrial concrete block buildings or um, or they know roofing um, and they can do you know metal buildings and so I don't think we want to say those people can't do that work anymore so you get into the definition of incidental architecture that engineers can do and incidental engineering that architects it goes the other way too um, and then it doesn't get rid of the gray area. You know, there's always going to be that gray area incidental. And, and, and the way we have it right now, I guess we're ultimately, instead of a definition, we're the judge of whether somebody is um, qualified to do architecture or engineering if a complaint comes to us. Um, so I'm, I'm wide open. <laughs> you know, I'm... Um, I could go either way. I mean, there's, there's, I think there's a benefit both ways to not having a definition and to having a definition. Just I, I, I certainly don't begrudge architects from defining w what your roles or responsibilities are. I just, I was curious about how you came to the conclusion and, you know, what thing, what elements you considered in coming to that conclusion. And maybe it would help. Or helping give us some insight when we consider that. I, I, I'm anxious to hear. I, I know you've got something to say about this. <laughs> um, but it, it would be hard for me. I haven't heard a really good, rational um, example of how this could benefit us, uh, the engineering side of the house, to define what an engineer does because we are – there are so many practice divisions, and um, we don't license as mechanical or electrical or other. We, I mean, we're PEs, we're professional engineers. So you you do 
mechanical and electrical by exam. I mean, you, you still put a PE behind your name, but as far as what you practice, but it doesn't preclude a civil can't. engineer from uh, tutoring under for four years with a graduate degree in civil engineering and working four years under a mechanical engineer and sitting for the exam for the to get a PE and being competent to practice mechanical engineering. We get applications for comedy where the engineer lists the disciplines and they list civil, structural, mechanical, electrical. On, I mean, it's not the normal thing, but it's not unusual to see that. So, I mean, it's like Alan said, if I, it, if I had worked under an electrical engineer when I went when I graduated, I I imagine I could do that stuff. You know, they could oversize yeah, everything. Never so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question. I mean, I'm just. Uh, I think, and, I'm but just, I will say I will say this. I mean, I I don't see a lot, and y'all do, I guess. Don't see a lot of uh, complaints where there's been a electrical engineer stamping structural drawings. You know, and it backs up the responsibility. And I'm not sure how. You, and we're trying to, to some extent, I think. But I mean, in the context of, of how many jobs are performed in this state every year and how many complaints we get, uh, it's an extraordinarily low percentage. But it, uh, the most of the ones I've seen or reviewed have been because somebody practiced multiple disciplines and based on some of the work that we've seen not thoroughly or competently in all of those disciplines I guess it'd be interesting on the other states that do have the definitions uh, what are they seeing as far as oh well once we open this up we've gotten people who were challenging oh, pieces that's a of good it. point um, maybe maybe that'd be good to see or you know the opposite you know once we did these definitions it just cleared up a lot I guess it'd be good maybe to find out how that's especially since there's so many that have and haven't I'm not sure who this question is for but whoever architects or chairman gentlemen or staff but is there a presumption that we cannot have a situation in which we define architecture and do not define engineering or that we define engineering and do not is there a presumption that we cannot have that or is that still an open possibility I can certainly look into that um, I have not heard the presumption but looking through these other state law and rules um, it appears that they all seem to have that is something that I, I would have to research I, I Regard to the architects are y'all of the opinion that you don't want you do want to have an engineering definition if you're going to have an architecture definition or do you care I think it would be preferable I don't think it's a deal killer yeah, I don't. I'm more concerned about our definition okay. I think well that's helpful to know I mean because I don't think I, don't, I mean I don't want to stand in the way of you all doing something that you feel is pertinent to the practice of architecture but by the same token I don't want to assume that you think that if you want to do that we're going to do that also we may or may not want to do that as a profession let me say this I mean we're we're a board right right uh, board of architects and engineers and how does what what benefit in in the in Roxana or or Liz in, in y'all's opinion from a political or or legal opinion or thought um, how does it benefit the board for us to define ourselves I mean if you're going to tell us nothing we need to beat the gavel and leave I, mean. I think it could benefit <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could benefit you from a consistency standpoint especially when you're assessing discipline um, you know Tennessee is in the not having a definition um, so to be consistent with the other states As you pointed out, not every state does have it, so it, it really is up to you all. Now, can it benefit? Yes, but I 
I would just caution that we don't hurt one of the programs or parts of it by doing it. So there's nothing that says we have to define it. One other, one other element, um, I apologize for monopolizing this. I'm anxious to hear from everybody else, but, but having read what the proposed practice of architecture definition is, I will tell you that I, I, I think I take a pretty significant exception of the incidental practice of engineering. And just a comment when looking at the proposed, um, neither committee liked the proposed language. I just gave it to you for reference <laughs> as to what, what you don't like, so we don't do the same thing moving forward. Um, so the for clarification, the architect committee did not like the definition that's listed here either. Thank you for stopping that fight before it occurred. That, that, was, that was smart. You brought us all together right off the bat. <laughs> Um, also, for reference, the the draft that was not well received um, was a combination of, I think, Alabama and Missouri um, state definitions that committee members did express at one point in time liking, but the thoughts might have changed. Um, so, it's if if you guys do decide to move forward with the definition, we can certainly craft from a different starting point um, or take your feedback and suggestions. I'm opposed to anything that models Alabama. <laughs> the state you prefer? South Carolina. I'm from Huntsville. Um, oh, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My sympathies. <laughs> you be careful. No, I went to Clemson we for the, moon, the record. You know. so. We put a man on the moon, you know. <laughs> That's true. It was a great engineering feat. <laughs> Correct, correct. <laughs> well, um, that, the, the part I was bringing up about other states and kind of getting a feel for it, is there any way, is that something that you could do to find out or is it something that, um, that we check with other, you know, just to see like, oh, you guys are opening up a can of worms to do that or uh, how do you operate without it? I mean, is there any way we can find that out? And we can. I think we can reach out to, and, and maybe with guidance from the board now, which which states do you think would have something closer re resembling us? Which states would we, um, had, that we've met individuals that are, you know, engineers or architects in this area, that we'd respect those definitions and want to start from? We can reach out to three, four, our neighboring states, or maybe not necessarily our neighboring states, you know, those that have had the, um, the licensing process the longest. However you see fit, we definitely can. It'll be in their statute, so that's the easy piece. We can just pull it. And we've also got um, conferences coming up for NCWS and NCARB, so I could get other attorneys in attendance at those conferences and see how, um, how long ago these definitions were created in their states, how they went about it, what the feedback was, et cetera. That would give us a little bit of more of a, <clears throat> just a history that we could go back to Speaking of history, and Robert, you may not, you may not want to comment, but I, I, what I'm interested in is I'm, I've, maybe our board has considered this in the past. You know, we've taken a stance, and, and not that we have to be tied to tied to anything like that, but it would be just good information for us to know why don't we have a definition now? How do we get here? Um, to that, and I'm I'm just, I'm thinking you've got more knowledge about you know where the board has been. I do, I know. I went back um, three uh, directors ago. I think that's right, uh, and they didn't know. Uh, okay. They they tried to reach out to some people that were a director or two before them and didn't get any. But why we did not have a definition. Uh, the recommendation I got is from that one was don't uh, because of some anecdotal stuff that they had been given from somebody a couple of administrations before. So I'm going back to seventies, you know. Wait, some of that. Well, she just said no. I just said it. Uh, it 
there was, and I don't know what the reason was, Frank. I mean, they, that was just the advice that they had been got given from somewhere else. Um, so I, I'm, I'm speaking anecdotally from something that you ask about history. I mean, um, and the history was that we have not done. And also, I think you're going to find the reality is is that we're probably one of the only states, if not the only state, that doesn't have a definition um, between the two. Now, we do have a joint board. Not everybody's got a joint board. That's that's part of the reason that some of these definitions have come into play. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I just, and Steve and I have had this discussion a couple times um, about definitions of engineering. We've got how many discipline cases every year? We've got how many registrants? How many times does this get in our way of doing the right thing? I just, I think it's a something searching, because the reality on these complaints, the reality on these discipline cases is we're still gonna have to go two thirds of the way through the process before we figure out what we've got. I mean, we still have to evaluate the complaint. We still have to read through the complaint. We still have to go through some level of talking to the person, looking at the thing. Um, and it's only at the, at the end where judgment is that we have to apply judgment to say, well, did you practice architecture outside of that? Or did you practice engineering outside of that? And I don't know how these definitions don't keep us in a lot of cases from having to still make that same judgment. Um, because, um, you know, I, I, and, and, and I'm not, I mean, if you guys want to do it, I'm fine. If the rest of the engineers think it's, they can come up with a definition, that's wonderful. But uh, my opinion is, is the, the engineering, um, I mean, I don't see anything in here about artificial intelligence. Um, I don't see anything about automotive vehicles. I mean, I don't see anything in here about virtual reality. And, and when I say that, you go, well, that's, Robert, you're just making crap up about stuff. But there's actually a task force that's a, a federal task force that's, I think, Google's convened. And there's only about automated cars, and there's only one engineering person on there. The rest of them have technology to or, you know, code people. But that's an engineer. I mean, trust me. Uh, I like what's going on. They need some engineers. Well, they need some. But, 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 but it's not, what I'm saying is... But that's not happening in Tennessee. That's happening in California. That's got a definition of engineering, <laughs> and it's and it's happening in other states that have definitions of engineering. And it's not keeping people from doing, considering engineering and or architecture and or the other things, um, and doing these things that are engineered systems. I mean, I look at you know some of the things that are going on with our. Um, with our these data conversations that have been going on, you know, with the Facebooks and all that stuff, and it sure seems that somebody needs some to at least ask an ethical question one, every once in a while. That I would hope that a professional like an architect or an engineer would at least ask an ethical question. Uh, but and all these states that all this stuff's going on in, I'll have definitions, <laughs> and it's not keeping them from doing those things. And I'm not, I'm probably babbling. Don't mean to be babbling. If you guys want one, I mean, knock yourself out. If the rest of the engineers want one, knock yourself out. I just don't know that the, a definition is going to solve problems that we're going to have, and the problems are going to be in the incidental practice of architecture, incidental practice of engineering. Do you have the expertise or don't you have the expertise? We're always going to have to decide that as a board looking at the evidence. Uh, I don't see that it's a magic bullet to get us out of that. And I think, in fact, it may leave loopholes, unintended loopholes, that we're all trying to scramble to close that somebody takes advantage of. And if we do have a definition, I mean, it needs to be like two sentences. <laughs> well, the I practice of architecture is architecture. The practice of engineering is engineering. I mean, seriously, because if we don't, the more words you put in there, the, the less you leave out. And, and that's just un the unfortunate part. Of it. We don't want you to write it. <laughs> well, let, let me explain. Let no, I do have a question. You, you do have an NCWS model law. And I, I know that's a national organization. I know y'all are members of it. And you intermingle with other members. And from what you Maybe that everybody but us already has a definition. I don't know that. But uh, if that's the case, how come everybody else is comfortable with it and we're not? 
And, uh, and I guess the question, another question is, and I was reading through. They're not as this, smart as we are. This, <laughs> oh, my God. This, what they have here is pretty simple and pretty direct. And basically what it says, if you do certain things, you're saying you're an engineer. I'll give you just one example of why. Uh, there's innumerable problems with, I think, the way this model law is written. But I can give you one example right now. I've seen people in the last four years provide expert testimony in court that were no more s no more experts in the field of engineering than one of my daughters, uh, who, by the way, do not have degrees of engineering and haven't practiced engineering, but uh, they've been in industry or construction, maybe not even related to what the expert testimony is giving. But if you if you read through this, if, if, if they went to some sort of a, a university where they were, um, they may have studied in engineering or they may have worked for an engineering company, they could, they could provide expert testimony and there's nothing in here that prohibits them from doing that. Now, Alabama actually has it written into their law that if you provide ex expert witness testimony, either by deposition or in testimony, related to uh, any, uh, against any engineer, then you are practicing engineering in the state of Alabama. And if you don't have a license and you do that, you, you can be fined. And it's a criminal act, actually. Well, we don't have that law. And this doesn't cover, th and, and again, that's one out of probably hundreds of potential examples that can bypass this if we try to define I'm Are concerned these, if we try to question, define do, it do these expert witnesses make some claims as to being an engineer they don't have to they're they're testifying against engineers without being a licensed professional they're evaluated by the by the judge based on their curricula to say that, the defense attorney would be asking this yeah. or you you're well, but, I mean, but the judge has to allow you in to be t to be to allow testimony so you write in a in a resume that you have done 14 drainage studies and that you've you know you and you get to be an expert witness on some level uh, without formally having education and understanding the uh, numerical basis behind what you're testifying to. Is that sort of correct, Mr. King? I may be a little sarcastic, but I'm sort of correct. Oh, you're exactly right. I've, I've been involved in many lawsuits with the city of Knoxville and I always have the attorney read it, get it in the record that the the expert that the judge has allowed is not licensed to practice in Tennessee, and that's all you can do that because it's you can do. totally up to the the judge. And I've Any never seen one is? contested. <laughs> but if we follow the model law, that's perfectly acceptable. Well, I'd like to talk about the model law just for a second because I I think it is important to go back to one of the issues that we're talking about with, relative to how do you define the practice of engineering. I was taught in school that if you give a definition of a word, you cannot use that word to define that word. And yet, it says, an individual, and I'm going to leave some words out because then it will make a lot more sense to you. An individual sh shall be construed to practice engineering if he or she practices engineering, A, or B, represents himself to be a professional engineer, or C, implies that he or she is a professional engineer. So apparently they have a real hard time defining engineering too without using the word engineering, which I think kind of goes to the base argument of the board on the engineering side feels like that we need the latitude to interpret what is engineering and whether or not the individual should be practicing engineering. And as long as we have the ability to do that, we feel like we can protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. But if we define it and restrict the words to mean things that people can poke holes in, then we will allow health, safety, and welfare to be at jeopardy. So that's, I, I would not be in favor of defining it because to be honest with you, engineering is changing faster than we can keep up with it. 
Kathy, I saw that too, uh, that part you just read. And, and I took that to, it was like it was written with discipline in mind to say, that to say practice is not only doing it, it's, it's looking like you're that. And that's the title act portion. And suggesting that you are. And we, don't we kind of have that already in our laws? That, I mean, we, right? That, um, and so I, so I don't think we need a definition to discipline people for practicing engineering because I, I, I think we've got the teeth in our law right now to do that. Um, so it gets me back into, okay, what, what does this do? What does it substantially do for us? And, I, and the only thing that I get back to is if maybe it's not even a definition. If we had a law that said if, if you've got an engineer stamp, you can't stamp an architectural sheet unless we agree that it's an incidental you know, incidental architecture and vice versa. If you've got an architect stamp, you can't stamp an engineering sheet unless it's incidental engineering. And to me, that's to answer your question out, and that could be helpful in reviewing a case in some, you know, in some cases it could be a, it's maybe an It's nearly open impossible shot. to clearly define what would be, or limit what would be incidental either engineering or incidental architecture, I think. But I, I think it would be tough. I think it would be tough to define that, but I, I hadn't tried to do it yet. So I'm not going to say that we, you we do it get, now without a definition. Yeah, I, I mean, mean we basically yeah yeah, and that that wouldn't change. Well, I don't, I don't know now. It's just do you know your stuff or not? If right. you're an architect That's and right. you can answer all my questions about mechanical right. engineering, it, there's nothing incidental. They can do the whole design. They can do a chiller plant, but it's, if it's, they know what they're doing. Right, but it's still incidental incidental to because it's not typically architecture. Well, I I don't I think of incidental more as as trying to define, you know, like if, if it's an engineer doing architecture, a much simpler, some kind of much simpler scope of architecture work, whether it's a, you know, a simple building that I've described before, or maybe it's, a, you know, some waterproofing or, or whatever, um, a piece of it. You know, I think, um, you know, we kind of, feeling that the engineers are not as uh, um, <laughs> uh, in, in, interested in the, the definition. Would you guys be, though, willing to let's just do some homework on what the other states have found out, just so we're not reinventing will. We may find out, you know, oh, that's the last thing you want to do, or here are some complications by it. Or we may find out, oh, these are some positives that we – because right now we're all dealing with the hypothetical, which is all we can do because we don't have definitions. But can we – if do you guys mind, maybe if we table this to our next one, and between now and then, I know we have our June meeting maybe with the NCAR, maybe we can – you know talk to some people about it as well as from legal, those other states, and just kind of see – you know, and we may come back and nothing changes the mind, but you know, at least we'll have a little bit more. I would encourage that. More information is, yeah. is much better in this situation. That the architects decide they don't want a definition anymore, but if they do, um, I'll also put on my to-do list to research whether or not we could have just a definition for architecture without yeah. also having a definition for engineering, just That'd be good. to make sure we're absolutely clear in case that's the route we end up wanting to go. Um, but if that's the case, I'm sorry, Liz, for interrupting you, but if, that, yeah. if that's the case, the whole board would have to approve or accept that? Okay. Yes. yes. That's just the, another question that's part of this. Too. You, in CARB, you get, I, I should know this, but I don't. I mean, I do because we've you've, you've changed a little bit. You get an in CARB what? Certificate. Certificate, right? And when you get that in CARB certificate, that allows you to be licensed in every state in the union or is. Do you have to still jump through? Speeds the process. It, the, yeah. You can you cannot have an in carb certificate and still get comedy. comedy. Yeah, it's just but, lot, but you don't have to be an in carb certified 
because I know CLARB was looking at going to where if you're not a CLARB certified, you can't get, uh, if I remember at one time, and it may be a, a while back, you couldn't call yourself landscape architect or something. Now, and, and that may be something I'm getting confused here. So well, no. every state has different yeah. requirements as far as um, accepting okay, so they're not like carb. A, but it's not a universal law. It's no. not a no, universal law. But okay. our state does accept that as one of the options for comedy for architects. Plenty, we accept plenty of architects that don't have in carb. Okay, so the in carb is just like NCWS is for us. It just speeds up the process and makes it simpler, so you're not having to provide references and every time you go. Like a clearing house. Okay, because because there had been some discussion. You all talked about what in carb had changed about the. And I, I didn't pay as much attention, and I thought maybe it was more of a, I, lack of a better word, national license, but that doesn't sound like, uh, sounds they, like a they've misunderstanding. They've changed, they've added ways to get a certificate. Okay. If you're not a NAB accredited, if you don't have a NAB accredited degree, okay. Okay. it's That's a lot more experience, and they, they evaluate your, your portfolio that you, it's, a, it's an expensive process to go through. graduate of an of a NAB approved approved uh, curriculum and I think that's something that you all have in your model all that I don't see in ours and if it is it's fine but when I mean, you do talk about being a registered architect and you, you you do use those terms I don't know that our the model law definition I don't think ever uses the words licensed and or registered in its definition and what you said Alton is exactly right I mean you could go to school and take a couple classes and call them, and, and they would meet this definition of uh, engineering education, potentially meet the engineering education and training uh, definition. Uh, and then, so that opens up technology and a lot of other things that, but you all at least use the word registered and licensed in here. And I think that's the ultimate goal is making sure that registered and licensed person is the one doing the yeah same thing in engineering i think the more license and that you don't you 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 reduce the number of occurrences of i think a lot of times too i think and i keep going back to this a lot of our a lot of a lot of our discipline issues between architecture and engineering or a lot of our have been almost in a lot of cases a case of preliminary plans preparation where they said I, I just did it to get it submitted to the whatever and I could it just seems like we got a lot of those that happened too and I don't know I may be misgeneralizing but I know we've got our legitimate cases but you know I just stamped them all because I had to get them into the local codes guy and I couldn't you know Fred was on vacation or Sally was on vacation get the fire marshal to do the code review for him yeah that's right that's right I mean I think that's I think it unfortunately is. that's happening in every industry and I don't know a definition would slow that down I'll shut up now no, I've got, I, 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 I got right one thing that um, I thought I'd read the very first page of title 62 under practice and persons exempt from registration it's interesting it says except as provided in subsections B and D nothing in this section shall be construed as requiring registration for the purpose of practicing architecture engineering or landscape architecture by a person provided that the person does not use the appellation architect engineer or landscape architect an appellation which compounds, modifies, or qualifies the words architecture, engineering, or landscape architecture, or which gives or is designed to give the impression that the person using same is an architect, engineer, or landscape architect. So that, I, th I think what that's saying is, except for some specifics in the following paragraphs, we're not telling people they can't practice architecture engineering. They just can't call themselves an architecture engineer or hold themselves out to be. And you just the read a, a good reason to have a definition. <laughs> I mean, if if it's undefined, then anybody that says I'm I'm doing it, but I'm not an architect. So no, but but it, even if we had a definition, I don't think the definition would change this. Tighten it up. 
Well, no, I mean, you can practice architecture as long as you don't call yourself an architect, is what this thing says. But then if you define architecture, you could. That's written like that, Ricky, because what we have is a title act only. It, that's, that's what we have. That's what our law is. And I, as I recall, I think there are two exceptions. One, you have to be a licensee if you do uh, work to a public work over a certain amount. And uh, it's, the law specifically says you get you get you can count experience if you're teaching at an accredited school. So you can conclude from that that that's engineering. But that's well, the only two specific examples that I know of that in our law that it says that it addresses anything other than the Title Act portion. Well, it, yeah, the following, what I just read, the very next sentence says you actually, it, it is unlawful for a person other than a registered architect or engineer to prepare plans or specs for any building or structure except for the following and then it lists the exceptions so so what in the engineering world there's you know it's building buildings is kind of a little part of engineering so you can you can be an engineer and design envelopes and whatever machine parts um, and not and and practice engineering and you're not registered just can't call yourself an engineer I guess it's and so if you had a if you had a definition of engineering I don't, I don't think it would change anything because if this unless this law changed if the law stayed the same you could say well I can practice engineering I don't need to be registered if I'm designing envelopes or whatever um, well if you had a definition you'd have to change that I would think because it really says two different things but I've, I've listened a while let me tell you what what I think and the engineering committee has heard from me before, but the architects haven't. I've been licensed since uh, 1983, and and I was amazed that we didn't have a definition. And I fought with other professions in Knoxville, particularly landscape architects and surveyors, about the overlap between civil engineering and, and those. The reason I like a definition is to help with other professions. Now we've got geology that has a definition in, in our law. Surveyors have the a very similar definition to the NCWS model law definition. Uh, but when, but that really doesn't make any sense unless you read the definition of engineering along beside it, but it's not in our law. So that's one point. Second point is I think it would be a, a mistake if we defined one and not all of them in this board. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it would defining our professions wouldn't matter at all to what we do on this board because we're still going to review the complaint. We're going to decide if the if the registrant's competent or not. I had a third thing, but I forgot it. So maybe it'll come to me. Well, your your last sentence makes a lot of sense. I mean, you can be a registered architect and be incompetent. You can be a registered engineer and be incompetent, and that's that's what we that's our purview, I guess you'd say, or part of it is deciding whether that's the case or not. And I I don't think um, that the NCAWS definition of engineering doesn't need a little work because that thing about expert witness testimony has driven me crazy ever since I've been a been a PE. So that that definitely needs some work, but. Uh, I guess the other thing was when it's rare that this is going to happen, and I don't know if it's ever happened in Tennessee, but when it, if you had a, a, a case that went far enough, the, the judge is going to interpret the, the Tennessee code as it's written, and it doesn't say anything about what any of our professions are. So how do we have a, a leg to stand on about you know, why anybody else can't do what we do? if we can even tell the public what it is so that's what i think and I, I think some of the this definition question came to a head after our last formal hearing where i think the judge made the comment that this would be a lot easier to resolve if we had a definition uh, but i am 
sort of perplexed about why originally we did, decided not to have a definition what the history of that is, and I, I appreciate Robert trying to find out, but I guess we, we still don't know. But I, I talked to Ted Wynn about it years ago. I used to be in the 80s. I was the TSPE liaison to the board and came to all the board meetings for several years and asked him about it one day, and he, he said that in other states you've got engineers and architects suing each other. We don't have that in Tennessee, and that's because we settle it right here. So we don't want to change that part. We, we want to settle it right here and not have our registrants suing each other. But I think we can have definitions and still keep that. Anybody else? All right. Do we have suggested states you'd like us to research or just whatever we can get our hands on? Or n naming which states? Okay. I mean, just pull what know. we can find. Yeah, I mean, do you? Don't anybody? go to Nevada. <laughs> None of the crazy ones. <laughs> no crazy, no crazy states. <laughs> Could you please leave the crazy states out? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Maybe we need a definition for crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the act incidental of being crazy. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we want to adjourn our meeting? Sounds great. All right. Well, we don't need a vote, do we? So moved. So everybody. <laughs> over all over, all all over right. motions. All right. All in, in favor. Robert rules of order. You as the chairman can say, I, <laughs> no, seriously, is that you can adjourn a meeting or you can call a recess without a vote. You can say, I sense that we are in agreement on this and let it go based He's on Robert's rules. Up. I'm not. Read it up. <laughs> Read it. This is